Hello YouTube, this is Carbonyl Dota. Today I am bringing you a video on the concept of the box with subtitles from PowerPoint. The point of this video is to demonstrate this strategy that I call the box. I bring this up in my coaching a lot. And I am going to be referring people back to this video in my future coaching session. So if you're coming from a coaching session where I chose to watch this video, hello. And if you're watching it right when I'm releasing it uh, in early February, 2023, then hello to you as well. So what is the box? What is in the box? Uh, so as I said, it's a name for a concept I use in my coaching. It's a way of thinking about how to play the game when one side has a somewhat significant lead. And you can also think of it as an organizing principle for your team's overall strategy Again, when one team has a somewhat significant lead. When does this happen? Literally every game of Dota, except for games like Griefers, or it's just a complete stomp of all three lanes from like the first five minutes. Um, so this is something you should be thinking about pretty much every game from both sides, regardless of if you're the team with the lead or the team without the lead. So the box mindset says that when you're ahead, you should corral the enemy heroes into their base or at minimum to behind whatever towers they still have up on the map. Um, so this sort of changes as you take more of their towers, but you know, they still have their mid tier two and off lane tier one, uh, you know, it's kind of normal and you adjust to that. And then once you take those towers, their box gets smaller. And then enemy heroes split pushing outside of or behind your area of control as the winning team is undesirable and should be dealt with. So you shouldn't let the enemy do that. Conversely, when you're behind, your objective should be to break out of or increase the size of the box. So the simple way to define the box is the losing team's enemy of control. So the winning team wants to make it small. The losing team wants to keep it as big as they can. So you could throw out this whole video, like, why do I need this video? I could just tell you to split push, right? Uh, but why does split pushing work? What makes it an effective strategy? So the box strategy, the, what I'm going to explain next the box strategy is a conclusion or kind of a plan of action resulting from the following basic Dota fundamentals. So Dota is a game of resources. Gold and XP become items and then abilities and talents. Out-resourcing your opponents is one of the most important factors in winning a game. Second, a team generally cannot control the entire map at once which is all three lanes and both jungles. You know, once they're 38k ahead and you're locking your base, you can, but it takes a lot of steps to get there. And this video, the box concept, basically explains, like, how do we get there as the winning team? How do we prevent that from happening as a losing team? So there are ways to progress the game. There are two ways to progress the game in Dota. This is point three. First, you take objectives, Towers and Roshan. So this allows you to shrink their box, right? Taking the towers or Roshan maybe allows you to break high ground, you know, really breaking their box and starting to win the game that way. Second is you're just getting more ahead. You're out farming the opponent for extended period of time. And eventually this will allow you to take these objectives, right? Number four, when leading the team with the lead generally wants to fight and kill the enemy using their already superior item and level advantage. You've gained a lead. You're happy to keep fighting them because you're ahead and you have better items and levels. Uh, notable exceptions are when particular spells like long cooldown ultimates or items like BKB or Refresher on cooldown or shortly before hitting a notable power spike. Even a team that's winning might want to back off and chill for a bit if their carry is about to hit their next item. Conversely, the team that is behind typically wants to not engage in a full team fight, instead preferring smaller pickoffs or skirmishes while their carry farms and catches up because their carry is probably behind. A couple more fundamentals here. Number five, when behind, cores will split push creep waves in the lane furthest away from where the enemy heroes are for safety. It's not always a core, it can be anybody, but that's generally, like the safest place on the map is the furthest away from where the enemies are. Uh, number six, creep wave equilibrium in the mid and late game is supremely important in establishing map control. It establishes vision, forces a response or obvious non-response from the enemy team, it also makes the jungle camps behind the lane that has been pushed out safer to farm. 
Number seven, map control is directly tied to your team's ability to take the fights you want or avoid the ones you don't want. So if you need to come back and like kind of revisit this, make sure you understand all of these, at least conceptually. Um, but these are kind of just basics in Dota that are relevant to this box strategy. Uh, so here we have this great meme of how we push waves in Herald and Guardian. And then all, there's all this complicated stuff that goes on, uh, you know, in these mid ranks. And then, but really with the Immortal, right? Once the, we reach Immortal, we're Zen. We're just like, dude, just push the waves. Um, you know, there may be some subtext here. I'm not sure. Returning to the definition of the box. So the losing team's area of control. When you're ahead, corral the enemy heroes into their base or behind whatever towers they still have up on the map. Kill heroes that leave their box. When you're behind, expand the box away from where the enemy is. Thus, the losing team should always be trying to spread out as much as they can without feeding, while the winning team should be trying to force the enemy into their base the smallest possible area of control for a team. There should be this constant equilibrium battle. The losing team wants to be like a water balloon, squeeze it or in Dota terms pressure in one area, and then the rest should expand away from where the pressure is happening. So in practice, what does this look like? For the winning team, having good wards that scout where the enemy is trying to farm, and then having the means, items, abilities, positioning, and the discipline to catch and kill heroes they see that leave their enemy that leave their area of control. Uh, so the positioning and discipline is key here. You have to be ready to react for when the opponent messes up because they are going to. And if you're not ready to punish it, then the enemy kind of gets to come back into the game or get things they shouldn't for free. Uh, in low MMRs, this is a huge problem. I'm talking about like Crusader Archon. The main way they mess this up is at this stage of the box where they don't position themselves aggressively on the map They'll like farm and then they'll just retreat. Even if they're ahead, they'll like retreat to their own side of the map to like keep farming safely. So they're not ready to punish the opponent that's behind when they try and like extend it places they shouldn't. They don't keep the control in the first place. Uh, so for losing teams, first and foremost, don't sp spread out. Sorry, I was going to say, I almost said don't spread out. First and foremost, you do want to spread out. Don't stack your whole team together if you don't want to fight them. Second, Having a wave-shoving, mobile, and hard-to-catch hero, or sometimes just an unimportant hero that, like, it's okay if they die, walk down the side lane furthest from the enemy heroes and push the lane as far as they can without getting killed. So sometimes it's even worth dying for this, although obviously you would prefer to do it and not die. And I want to note here in pubs, like, this, that's the, as a losing team, that's kind of like the ideal scenario is, right, you're like mobile, puck, or whatever, split-pushing, right? But, like, in your pubs, your team's not going to be doing this well. Um, what I see when I coach low MMR players, when I watch these replays, is, like, nobody's doing this. Um, so, really, what you need to take away from this, if you're watching, is that you need to be doing it because nobody on your team's doing it. <laughs> so, like, the ideal hero that should do it, like, I'm just bringing that up because, like, that's kind of how it should work at, like, a higher level. But... It needs to start with somebody doing it, and that somebody should be you in your games, especially if you're below, like, Divine, basically. Um, I see people in Divine even do this wrong, or, like, nobody will do it. So, uh, basically, you should do it if nobody on your team is doing it already. Uh, and this is part of why it's better to play a hero that clears waves in low MMRs, so that you can do this effectively when nobody else on your team does it. Uh, so, for the losing team, properly executing the expand the box strategy provides the following benefits allows the hero to farm. It possibly opens up the jungle camps behind where the lane has been pushed out. It possibly forces a reaction from the enemy team, which detracts from their ability to contain your team on the other side of the map. It allows your team to have an opportunity to take a favorable engagement while the enemy splits up. And at bare minimum, it extends the game, giving further opportunities later to turn the game around. Maybe your enemy will just throw. For the winning team, properly executing the keep them in the box, shrink the enemy box strategy provides the following benefits. It denies the enemy golden XP, slowing down their item and level progression. It prevents them from getting good vision down. It allows you to substantially increase your net worth lead. It keeps the map control you need in order to pressure your next objective, e.g. you're keeping the enemy in their base while waiting for the next Roshan, 
which generally leads to a free uncontested Roshan for you. And it keeps your team generally close together and ready to react to moves the opponent makes, such as a smoke attempt. Uh, so this is what I was getting at before, like, where lower Mars don't do this. The higher Mars, like Legend, Ancient, Divine, they start to be getting pretty good at this. They'll play the map aggressively. They'll be together on the opponent's side of the map, not letting the opponent out. They don't do it super consistently or all the time, but you guys at that level do start to do that somewhat consistently. So here's some mini-map examples we're going to go over. This is the second part of two parts of this video. So in this first example, we see the Zeus split pushing top while the enemy pressures bottom in this first box. I've drawn in red where the box basically is for the Radiant side who's behind. And little arrows here uh, that show where we're expanding the box out. And then as the enemy moves towards top in this like second and third image as they're moving this way, the Enigma starts to push out this bottom lane. So this is just the very basics of the equilibrium aspect of the box. Enemy team's bottom, somebody split pushes top. Enemy team moves top, somebody starts to pressure bottom. Or relieve pressure and shove out bottom. Ex extend the box that way, away from where the enemy is. So part of what this Zeus is doing in the first two images is making sure the box doesn't stay small on the top side of the map while the enemy's all bottom. So here in example two, it doesn't have to be heroes doing the split pushing. Uh, so here, Eidolons push out top lane very far, and the enemy invoker reacts to this. He boosts of travels into the wave, and then Artekis picks him off. I say Artekis, it was the Techies. I was the Zeus in this game. Whatever. You can see this invoker got punished by splitting up. So this goes back to that core tenant I talked about, a fundamental of, like, you can't control the entire map at once. Right? The Dyer can't control the entire map at once. In these first two images, you can kind of see they're controlling top and bottom. And this invoker, or sorry, they're they're controlling mid and bottom. Sorry. And then in this third panel, you see the invoker TP's top trying to control all three lanes, and the radiant punishes that. So make sure you're controlling two lanes at once. And then generally what happens is you'd want to like sweep as a team to the other side where you think the enemy are. And then, you know, ideally another hero on the Radiant side would sweep bottom and make sure they don't get like locked in bottom, which is what I'll show you here. The enemy team's all top now. So the Zeus again, extends the box bottom. And so I wanted to talk about a couple different concepts here in this second image with all these like funny arrows, right? So the red arrow is our box, right? Or sorry, the red lines are box and we're extending the box outwards this way. If the Zeus had not done this here, this little dashed red line represents maybe the box would still be smaller on the bottom side of the map, yes? If the Zeus wasn't doing this. And this yellow line is showing where the Dyer is going to move now because the Zeus has pushed it out. So they're gonna have to take a longer route and catch this wave. It might even be up here by their tier one by the time they get here, as the Zeus is pushing it out. In the meantime, the Drown Enigma can farm somewhat some of the jungle behind where the Zeus has pushed the lane out. And if the Zeus had not done this, this dash line represents where the Dyer might be able to go because the creep waves wouldn't have been pushed out here. If the Dyer was able to immediately cut in this way, they could catch a Greedy Enigma taking this jungle camp or a Drow taking the jungle camp. It would be a very simple move, very fast, and the, the Radiant would be locked in their base bottom. And this blue arrow is just going to show how this pressure should work in the future. So as the Dyer makes this move bottom, we immediately, somebody wants to be pushing out top again, right? They can't control all three lanes at once, especially not in this phase of the game where there's still several towers up for the Radiant. So if you see the Dyer making this move towards bottom, we want to get a hero pushing out top. So here is example number four. This is an example of the Dyer team in this case effectively executing the box from the winning side. So we see pickoffs. So you see... I've got some arrows here. We're keeping the map pressure on. Radiant does not have a lot of breathing room right now. What happens is this tusk shows in the triangle, the Radiant tusk, while this drow who showed mid then shows in the jungle under this great ward that the Dyer has set up. This is not allowed, as I indicate with my not allowed uh, text boxes here. And the Dyer quickly punishes with good positioning. So what enables this? Good wards, good positioning. 
Ursa connected bottom and the outpost. See, the Ursa's in base, but now he's bottom. He TP'd to the outpost with a TP. They kill the Drow. And the Tiny connects with his Lich and Viper in the triangle quickly to kill the Tusk. So what happened here? The Radiant tried to go into areas they could not control. If you just walk into the jungle when you're behind and you don't have vision in those areas, you should feed. This is what should happen. The Dire executed this great. The Radiant made these really low skill plays here. And the key when you're ahead, again, is to be ready to punish these mistakes. If this Invoker's farming his triangle, um, or this Ursa just doesn't TP down here, right? This Drow doesn't die. And then we just gave this Drow free, like, farm and, like, access to this area that she really shouldn't have gotten. Same thing with the Tusk. If this Tiny is not here and this Viper's not here and they're not ready to punish this Tusk, then the Radiant maybe dewards their triangle and gets up some of their own vision. So you have to be ready as the winning team to punish this. This is why you need to play on the enemy side of the map when you're ahead. Low MMR players, you don't really do this at all. Uh, mid MMR players, you do it inconsistently. Or you don't do it with vision. Or you don't like have good vision when you try to do this and then the enemy takes a good fight. Uh, so example five of doing this wrong or basically missing your opportunity. So we're going to look at the Sven here. Notice the Sven is top in this first image. And then two of his allies get picked off, which I'm indicating here. as this, And the Sven moves towards mid anyways. The Sven has this area up here to farm, up top. But he moves towards his team. Granted, they did. the Radiant does get a dire pick off here, and then they chase a bit. But the end result of this play, I mean, hypothetically, if they wipe the dire or something, it's good. But they didn't really have the capabilities to do that. Um, the dire got away with no real issues. And the end result is top lane never gets pushed out further. The Radiant does not gain access to the Dire jungle in any way. No reactions are required from the Dire to address the top side. So they are free when their enemy or when their allied hero, the Dire, the one dead here on the Dire, when that hero respawns, the Dire is just free to resume pressuring bottom at their convenience without having to split up. And remember, they're ahead, so they're happy to do this. And if the Radiant tries to fight them, they will probably lose. So... The Sven should have just pushed out the top side here, um, farmed it up. His teammates can come farm behind him, perhaps. Um, try to extend the box, and he just doesn't here. So here's example number six of keeping them in the box. So this is that same Sven game. We're kind of thinking about it from the Dyer's perspective now as the team that's winning. So this is going to show I've got some timestamps and net worths here. So you can see at 39.26, 16k ahead. So quite far ahead, right? Um, you know, this is not going to be easy for Radiant by any means. And this is just to show how to execute this box trade. We've got some great wards, some dire wards watching this top side of the map. And then eventually the CM even gets a, you can see it in this last image, a little ward here to watch the bottom side. So we've got great control over all the lanes. The SF, so most of the team's trapped in the base. The SF walks top outside of their area of control, outside the box, immediately it's punished by the Void Spirit and gets picked off. Our CM, or the Dire CM I mean, does die in the jungle, but not a good trade-off obviously, and the box has not um, been increased because the Dire did a great job of punishing when the Radiant tried to leave the box. And to continue this example, we see the Spirit Breaker again try and leave the box, again gets punished, the Void Spirit plus the Global Dawn Breaker comes in. Oh, one thing I wanna mention, is when you have global participatory heroes like Dawnbreaker, Zeus, Spectre, those heroes can play their own side of the map and still be ready to control and fight and keep the box small for the enemy while not being there. Versus if you're a hero that needs to be there, you know, not a global hero, then it's probably not a good idea to be like farming your own jungle way back where this Dawn is right now. Um, or if the Dawn didn't have ultimate, it would be the same thing, right? If you don't have the ability to contribute by being really far away, then you probably shouldn't be that far away from your team, right? And it's not that, and remember your team as the winning side, the Dire, if we just hypothetically imagine they don't have global heroes, right? They don't need to be farming this side of the map. If they just farm the Radiant side of the map and jungle and the waves, and then the Radiant farms no camps, you're still increasing your lead against the Radiant without farming all this. The problem that low skill players have is they're like, oh, there's farm back there. I should go take it. But that lets the Radiant out onto their own side of the map, which we don't have to do. So it's better that you farm this 50% of the map here 
and they farm like zero or 10% rather than you farm this 50% or 60 and then they farm this like 30 or 40. There's this discrepancy value here where if you lock them in, it's always going to be better even if you're not getting quite as much as you could be getting hypothetically if you farm the entire map. Hopefully that wasn't too complicated. Um, something to keep in mind. Uh, so here we pick up the Spirit Breaker who tries to leave the box, kill him. The enemy is now completely locked in their base. This is the ideal scenario when you're ahead. This leads to the completely free Roshan and we have increased our lead from 16k at 39 minutes to 22k up 6k gold by 42 and a half minutes plus a free Aegis. This game ends pretty soon after this. So quiz time as we're getting close to the end of the video. Hopefully you're still with me. Take a look at this mini map in this game where the Radiant is ahead. Where do you think the box is? How should the Dyer extend the box? Take a second, pause the video if you want. I'm going to continue. So right now their box is quite small encompassing mostly their base. They do have a little bit of this control bottom side, but you can see with three heroes in the enemy triangle, it's not, not real control really. I could have even drawn this smaller. But the Pudge is down here with a creep wave, so I, I, I gave him some credit. So how should the Dyer extend the box? This little arrow top, somebody should push out the top side, right? The enemy is all bottom. We should push out the top side a bit. So let's see what happens in this game. Well, Axe extends the box. Good for him. He did it. However, he stayed top for too long. He pushed out not only this wave here, I think there was a wave back here too. He like pushed out this wave and then this wave, which is decent, two waves. Usually all you can get in this scenario. He went to the third wave, and if you've ever seen your low MMR carry do this, you know what's about to happen. <laughs> he dies because he stayed way too long, especially against a Ricky who just, you know, that guy is going to pick you off if you're, you know, it seems like a spirit breaker, right? If you're showing for too long, like the enemy will just come kill you. So... He gets killed staying too long. Um, however, notice that the Ricky and Lena are here. So the Dyer could have taken this opportunity as a four-man group to try and break out of the box bottom. This would be a 4v3, possibly in the Dyer's favor. So even with the axe slightly messing up and doing this too much, it still created this opportunity to take a 4v3 in this other side of the map. So the Dyer didn't take that opportunity in this game, which you could say is a missed opportunity. But they had it because of the axe trying to extend the box this way and drawing Radiant Heroes away. Um, so the end result of not trying to break out of the box on the bottom side when we see Heroes top and it kind of playing the box too much and trying to extend it too far without the right information on the top side leads to the Dyer being stuck in an even smaller box and little hope to come back from this situation, uh, especially with Heroes like TA, Ricky, and Beastmaster who just provide insane vision, right? Hawks, traps, Ricky running around invis. So very hard for the Dyer now in this scenario to come back. So that's the video, guys. Um, I hope you learned a lot. This is the box. Let me know if you have questions. And this is just how you need to play Dota when one side is like ahead, right? If it's a very even game, functions a little differently. Not the point of this video. But when one side is ahead, this is how you have to think of it from ahead and from behind. Thanks for watching. I will catch you in the next one. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't already, sub to the channel. And if you want to be coached by me, check the link in the video description. You can join my Discord there, and there's all the information there on how to sign up.